Incredibly, all over Berlin, in tiny cubicles and closets, in damp cellars and airless attics, a few of the most hated and persecuted of all Nazi victims hung grimly to life and waited for the day when they could emerge from hiding. They did not care who arrived first, the Americans, Russian or British, as long as somebody came. And quickly, some lived in twos and threes, some as families, some even in small colonies. Most of their friends thought them dead, and in a sense, they really were dead. Some had not seen the sun in years or walked in a Berlin street. They could not afford to be sick, for that would mean getting a doctor, immediate questions and possible disclosure. Even during the worst bombings, they stayed in their hiding places, for in air raid shelters, they would have been spotted immediately. They preserved an iron calm, for they had learned long ago never to panic. They owed their very lives to the ability to quell nearly every emotion. They were resourceful and tenacious, and after six years of war and nearly 13 years of fear and harassment in every capital of Hitler's Reich, almost 3,000 of them still survived. That they did was a testimonial to the courage of a large segment of the city's Christians who protected them. None of them were ever to get the adequate recognition of the fact that they protected the despised scapegoats of the new Nazi order, the Jewish people. Sigmund and Margaret Weltlinger both in their late 50s, were hiding in a small ground floor apartment in Pankow. A family of Christian scientists, the Murings, risking their very own lives, had taken them in. The Murings shared their rations and everything else with the Wettlingers and had never complained. Only once in many months had the Wettlingers dared to venture out. An aching tooth prompted them to take the chance, and the dentist who extracted it accepted Margaret's explanation that she was a visiting cousin. For two years, the outside world for them had been only a patch of sky framed by buildings, plus a single tree which grew in the dismal courtyard facing the apartment's kitchen window. The tree had become a kind of calendar of their imprisonment. Twice we have seen our chestnut tree decked out in snow, Margaret told her husband. Twice the leaves had turned brown and now it's blooming again. She was in despair. Would they have to spend yet another year in hiding? Maybe, Margaret told her husband. God has forsaken us. Sigmund comforted his wife. They had a lot to live for, he told her. Their two children, a daughter 17 and a son 15, they were in England. The Wettlingers had not seen them since Sigmund had arranged to get them out of Germany in 1938. Opening a Bible, he turned to the 91st Psalm and slowly read, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And all they could do was to wait. God is with us, Immanuel, he told his wife. Believe me, the day of liberation is at hand. In the previous year, more than 4,000 Jews had been arrested by the Gestapo in the streets of Berlin. Many of these Jews had risked detection because they were unable to stand confinement any longer. Hans Rosenthal, 20 years old, was still hiding in Lichtenberg and was determined to hold out. He had spent 26 months in a cubicle, barely 6 feet long and 5 feet wide. His existence up to now had been perilous. His parents were dead and at 16 he was put in a labor camp. In the March of 1945 he escaped and without papers took a train to Berlin and refuge with his mother's friend. But he did have a Bible, a small radio, and on the wall, a carefully marked map. Much as he hoped for the Western Allies, it seemed to him that the Russians would capture Berlin, and that worried him even though it meant his release. He reassured himself by saying over and over, I am a Jew, I have survived the Nazis, and I will survive Stalin too. On the other side of Berlin, 
27-year-old Joachim was living with a Christian family too. Their eldest daughter Eleanor came down to the basement to meet Joachim to discuss the condition of Berlin. They were lovers since 1942 and Eleanor, making no secret of their friendship, had been disqualified from attending a university because of her association with a Jewish person. Now they longed for the day they could marry. Eleanor was convinced that the Nazis were militarily bankrupt and that the collapse would come soon. Joachim believed otherwise. The Germans would fight to the bitter end and Berlin would sure become a battlefield. Perhaps another Verdun. They also disagreed about who would capture the city. Joachim expected the Russians, Eleanor expected the British and Americans. But Joachim thought they should be prepared for any eventuality. So Eleanor was studying English and Joachim was mastering the Russian language. Although they were not in jail, another group of prisoners was living in Berlin. Uprooted from their families, forcibly removed from their homelands, they had but one desire, like so many others, and that was for speedy deliverance. By anybody, it didn't really matter now. These were the slave laborers, the men and women from almost every country that the Nazis had overrun before. There were Poles, Czechs, Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, Dutch, Belgians, Luxembourgers, French, Yugoslavs and Russians. In all, the Nazis had forcibly imported nearly 7 million slave laborers, the equivalent of almost the entire population of New York City at the time, to work in German homes and businesses. Some countries were bled completely white, 500,000 people were shipped out of Holland and 6,000 from tiny Luxembourg. More than 100,000 workers, mostly French and Russian, worked in Berlin alone. The manpower situation in Berlin had become so critical that the Nazis openly flouted the Geneva Convention, using prisoners of war as well as foreign workers for essential war work. Because Russia was not a part of the Geneva Convention, Red Army prisoners were used in any manner that the Germans saw fit. There was now in fact little distinction between prisoners of war and foreign workers. As conditions deteriorated day by day, prisoners were being used to build air raid bunkers, to help rebuild bombed military quarters and even to shovel coal in industrial power plants. Jean Bottin, 20-year-old mechanist and slave laborer from Paris, felt especially cheerful. He knew he was playing some part in the Germans' downfall. He and some Dutch workers had been sabotaging tank parts for years. The German foreman had repeatedly threatened to ship saboteurs off to concentration camps, but he never did. And there was a very good reason. The manpower shortage was so acute that the plant was almost totally dependent on foreign workers. Jean thought that the situation was pretty amusing. Each ball bearing part he worked on was supposed to be finished in 54 minutes. He tried never to turn in a finished piece in under 24 hours and that was usually defective as well. The forced laborers had one simple rule, every unusable part they could sneak in brought victory and the capture of Berlin another step closer. So far no one had ever been caught and very soon their work would pay off. 